what can families do? Well, they can check children's social media use for harassing or sexual comments in photos. I had a mom ask me the other day, do you think it's wrong that I check all my daughter's texts and emails? Uh, and I said, well, have you told her that you're doing this? And she said, yes, I have. And I said, and is that part of the agreement here? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, I don't see a problem in the world with it. I think you're being a good mother. It's not like she's sneaking behind the kids back. And what we know from our research is when teenagers are part of setting the rules, whether it's how much television is watched, how much time on computer, blah, 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 they go along with them better. So I think this mom was doing it just right. Um, if the child is sending bullying messages to other kids, making fun of them and on and on, trying to tear them apart, tear them down, then I think you should recommend to your families taking away all media privileges immediately from that kid and discussing the social legal implications. You know, the stories go on. An 18-year-old high school senior, his girlfriend, underage, sent him a sexy picture. He sent it out, distribution of child pornography, pulled out of, of um, his home and arrested. Yeah. I mean, there are social, there are legal implications to this. So if kids are being the cyber bully, parents shouldn't sit around and say, oh, there have always been bullies. That, that, that dog don't hunt, really does. Okay, if the kid is receiving cyberbullying messages, then you recommend uh, contacting the harassing child's parents. Now, you've got to be careful here. So if your kid is bullying my kid, uh, you have a teenage daughter, i got a teenage daughter. Yours is saying mean, nasty, awful things about mine, and she's spreading the word out. She's making fun of her. Now. A good thing to do. See, what is the school supposed to do? Everybody turns to the school. Oh, this stuff happens off campus. The school has to deal with it Monday morning, what's been sent out over the weekend, or the next day, what's been sent out that night. The school cannot police what kids are doing on technology off their grounds. Am I, am I right? I have school district people here. I have private school people here. So it is not their job. So you have to talk to your families about doing it. So I first contact her, but I've got to have the message, and I can send it to her and say, first of all, most cyberbullying isn't reported, so this may be unlikely because most kids don't talk about it, they're embarrassed, etc. Now, the problem is, with some of the families we deal with, if the family I'm going to contact is a violent family, I would be foolish to contact them because I don't want that retaliation. So I have to figure that out. Now. I can let the school know that this has happened. As a matter of fact, it's a kindness to let the school know because on Monday morning or the next day, when the kids are going at it at school and everything's being stirred in the pot, the school official should know. But it's not the school's job. And if it's bad, you can contact the police. Now, there's all kinds of monitoring things that you can put on your computers. And unfortunately, and I recommend them, I recommend them. But uh, unfortunately, kids are finding their way around them. As a matter of fact, it was advertised on television a few months ago that now they're putting something out on Facebook uh, where you can isolate who gets what message. So mom and dad only get certain of your messages, but others don't. So there's always money to be made somewhere. Now, the important thing is if your kid or kids you know about receive bullying messages, they should never, ever, ever retaliate. You know, my father wanted to teach my brother to hit back. That was the wrong thing to do. Having a kid, this is why we think about things, send out an angry message back is a natural thing to do. But we can't have kids do that because it just stirs the pot. A uh, family that I worked with, mom thought it was really funny. It's an out-of-state family, and the daughter was being bullied terribly, oh, terribly by other kids for all kinds of things that were just not her fault. So the mother had, the little girl had her birthday. She had a birthday party. These are middle school age kids. So she had three or four other girls over. So what did they do during the party that they thought was really funny? They went ahead, and they sent texts and pictures to this one girl who was the primary bully of the daughter, 
whose birthday it was, about what a good time they were having. Look at the cake. You weren't invited. Ha, ha, look at what you're missing. Mom was part of this retaliation. So I said to Mom, do you think that was a good idea? And she said to me, it's just in good fun. It was all in good fun. I said, but how does your daughter feel? And she said, well, she doesn't like it, but it was time. She didn't mean it was in good fun at all, did she? It was time for this other gal to see how it felt. That's the wrong thing because that just causes escalation. OK. Cyberbullying is prevalent when kids are with peers and they require more adult supervision. Please understand that most cyberbullying en masse means it's OK to do it. Kids view it as a joke, gossip, they Photoshop out somebody's picture of the, from the class. Mean things, mean things. Empathy and remorse are minimal if everyone's doing it. And I hear that even more from adults than I do from kids. I know adults who will give their parents, remember there's one, the boy didn't want to do his homework. Well, what kid loves to do homework? No kid walks in the door and says, oh, please, let me start my homework. They, you know, maybe they do that in first grade, but that ends pretty quickly. Right? <laughs> that's not 12-year-old that's not behavior or anything. So um, what happens is that the kids, feel that they can get away with arguing against parents. We have a lot of that civility crisis going on. This particular mom said to her son, well, if you finish your homework without complaining tonight, I'm going to let you take the Game Boy to school tomorrow. Little one, little handheld one. That's not allowed at the school. She knew that. She said, I said, they let them bring these things to school where they can play games. And she said, oh, no, it's totally off limits. But she said, you know, everybody's doing it. The kids do it all the time. I was so tired of his complaining over homework, and I'm sure the teachers have a way to handle it. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, kids are bullied typically over appearance and speech. And those are um, the major things. Weight. A lot of parents bully their kids over weight. We talk about, we talk about you're getting too fat, can you fit into this kind of stuff. But uh, appearance and speech, special ed kids are more continuously bullied over years, over years, than any other group. When I taught my class of kids with behavioral and um, developmental delays in Syracuse, they used to stand outside the room by the water fountain as people changed classes, as the other kids changed classes. And I would let them come in a minute or two late, because if they walked into the special ed room, they were called retards, right? Not a very nice name. They made me, and I agreed. They didn't make me do anything, but I agreed. We had narrow windows like this. We put cardboard over them. That made me feel terrible. But my own kids didn't want to come in because they didn't want to be seen in special ed classrooms, right? Because they were different. They were going to be bullied. But guess what happened within my own classroom? The kids who were of higher intelligence or physically bigger or more able to pick out kids with vulnerabilities, what did they do? They bullied each other right in my room. It's very, very, very hard. I have a question. Yes. So what's your suggestion for counteracting the anger and frustration that that child is carrying around as a result? As a, for which kid? Because what I do... The special, the special needs children yes. that are being bullied that now becomes angry and... That's frustrated. right. And we're going to say that in just a minute, but I want to tell you that it's how... Your, your point is so on target because it's how bystanders handle bullying that either reinforces it or helps to get rid of it. If indeed we say to the kids, this is wrong, go through that list of things I gave you, how would you feel, and on and on. We stop the bullying, but then we have to convince the kid who is being bullied that he or she is a worthwhile person. Remember the early slides that I showed you? Self-esteem, supportive on an ongoing basis, having them be 
uh, successful at anything, the promotion. So what I did, but you know, um, I would do in my classroom what I did in my house. If the mouth is bad, doesn't need to be in my presence, your brother's presence, or anybody's presence. Sweetheart, you just go in your room and you come out when I feel like it. That's what timeout's about in the classroom, and that's the way I handle it. I believe in tough love. Okay? Um, passive kids. Passive kids get bullied an awful lot. The quiet kids, the anxious kids, the insecure kids. And again, research on shooters. What do so many people say when somebody's walked into a school with a gun? What did they say afterwards? Their neighbors, the school officials. He was such a quiet kid. He was such a quiet kid. Yeah, Columbine. <laughs> Who was it? Diebold and Harris, the shooters at Columbine. The trench coat mafia. Parents said, yeah, they went around with these trench coats. They never washed. They smelled. Their hair was stuck together. But we thought, hey, kids are weird, right? No, 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 no. Those are the kids that we need to be pulling into the group. Exclusion can really result in violence. You disenfranchise people. We can look at the world situation across the Middle East and everywhere else. The poor and disenfranchised may turn to violence. Again, going back to that sense in the subway, I've got nothing to live for anyway, so I've got nothing to lose. Okay? Uh, kids with hyperactivity, kids with difficulty concentrating are abused a lot too, or receive a lot of uh, the cyberbullying. If a peer, and this goes right back to your question, if a peer is a victim, in other words, if there's a kid in the class and you find out one of your kids uh, is a victim of cyberbullying, the first thing you do is tell kids if you receive a message, don't forward it. Again, we bystanders have to take charge. Tell the bully to stop. Bullies get reinforced. Tell them to stop. There was um, a study that came out just a few weeks ago, who said that uh, the cool kids in the school, the cool kids are the ones who are tending to do the most cyberbullying. We used to think of the kids who were the physical bullies of being the cast-offs, the gang members, et cetera, right? Now, we have to ask ourselves about that because with the cool kids, are they cool because this aggression is promoting their social status or are they taking advantage of their popularity by cyberbullying others? So if we tell this popular kid, cut it out, stop. But everybody wants to be in with the popular kids, don't they? I know that's a tough one. And let the victim know it's not true. He said that about you. That's just stupid. Yes? We're finding out that bystanders have more power to stop bullying than anything else. So I see that the programs that are going into the schools and talking about the need for the other kids who have nothing to do with the bullying at all, they have the power to change this. Excellent. More than anybody else. You're right. Excellent. It is the bystanders. It's reinforcement theory, isn't it? If you, reinforcement, if you reinforce it, it's going to continue. If you cut off the reinforcement or turn negative towards the cyber bully, that has to be the way to cut it back. Messages have to be shown to the parents, too. That's very important. Uh, kids can view this stuff as a contest. So they're sitting at home at night. And somebody sends out a negative message, um, negative photo about somebody else. And the kids wait around to see what's the response of that person going to be. That's why kids retaliate quickly. Then the first person who's doing the bullying retaliates. To kids, it's a game. They don't get it that those messages and things, those photos, are on there forever. Um, a very effective program in, um, has been one that's been in New Haven, Connecticut. And this has been uh, Bob, which uh, is back off bully. And this is where there is an anonymous method of reporting cyberbullying. It can be playground bullying, not play, just playground, but out of school physical bullying as well. So what you need in order to participate is you have to be hooked up to the internet. Okay? So kids on any type of machine up, uh, hooked up to the internet. There's an app that they provide the kids with this BOB program, back off bully program. 
that lets them anonymously click in and report a bullying incident. There is a group of adults who take it from there. The kid who is sending in the message can forward the message, photos, etc. If they want to, there's a follow-up app, please, if you'd like to send us the details. And then the victim of the bullying is also given a list of things to do, all of this on the app, and they can meet with the counselor while the adults in the school are saying, okay, if it's physical bullying, this kid's at such and such a place. If it's cyberbullying, we've got some messages. We're going to pull the parents in. We're going to take it forward. And we're going to pull the child in. And we're going to say, this isn't going to work here anymore. And it has, it, it's not an expensive program. They make a lot of their money. They have, they have had a grant. They've had national awards. They sell Bob t-shirts the kids wear around the school, back off bully, so everybody knows about it. But they're setting up a model now. It's been so popular for other schools to uh, pick up on. And um, as I was coming in today, I was visiting here with um, Miss Healy from uh, Northside Independent School District. She's the director of counseling there. Would you please share, if you would, the ideas that you told me about Peace Corners and Peace Place? Because I think that's helpful to our audience. Good afternoon. We were talking earlier about strategies, and one that some of our counselors have used is called a Peace Place, which can be in the counseling office itself. And it sort of gives students an opportunity to situate where, where do you go? How do you start that conversation? So it invites the context for um, problem solving. So they sit with their counselor, and they can go to that part of the room to the Peace Place. And some have it decorated to where it looks like a special place. Others, it's just kind of a corner of the room. Um, talk about peaceful solutions, conflict resolution. Um, we also use Kelso's Choices, which is a conflict resolution model for young children. We use the leader in me to help build and foster resiliency and leadership in, in kids. So it's not just peace place, it's a lot of other things. The 40 Assets, which um, is off of Emmy Werner's Research and Resiliency that Dr. Walden talked about. Um, the Six Pillars of Character from the Josephson Institute of Ethics. 15 days of caring from the Trevor Romaine program. So it's, a, it's many, many things. It's not just one thing, but Peace Places, um, it's a, one of the recommendations of the American Psychological Association, Peace Corners and Peace Places, that they actually help put it top of the mind um, that it is important to build peace and to think of uh, peacefulness as a skill, not just as a trait, but as a skill that we can teach children um, and that we can cultivate and, and that we model for ourselves. That's terrific. That's terrific. Other programs that um, we have, well, um, or you have in your schools, or you have worked with your families. How about, you want to talk a minute about our peer mediation program downtown? You want to share that? I haven't been involved in that? Well, this is where, has anybody been involved in it? Steve, yeah, yeah. the Steve's at Winston. Steve, would you describe that? I didn't mean to put you on the screen. It's actually called Maine. It's a video mediation. And it's actually through the Bear County a mediation group that they'll come out to schools and they'll, they'll train uh, fifth grade and up the kids how to do you know, conflict resolution. As long as there's no violence, uh, they can, they're trying to go in and mediate the 20 years. And I'm going to say that th this is from the Dispute Resolution Center. So if you want to find out more about it, the numbers are on the uh, green or the flyer, uh, green handout of the flyer. But um, I'm going to say that their success rate, Steve, the kids' success rate in solving mediations amongst peers is something like 97 or 98 percent. Can you believe that? 97 or 98 percent of the mediations that they have end up in peaceful, um, by peaceful means that have been suggested by the kids. Um, we're finishing up, uh, but any other programs that you have that you'd like to share with the group because you people are really out there doing it every day or any questions well I thank you for being such a wonderful audience today you can go. thanks so much.